Well, thank you, and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak here. So the title says something about derivatives, but I decided to skip derivatives and start with Calc 2. Let's see. So I'm going to do integration. So uh, f in line sitting in P1, and I have some function I want to integrate, which is essentially uh, the periodic value of my uh, number. And, uh, well, the function is constant on these uh, uh, pieces. And so, well, to integrate, I'm going to integrate this over the periodic numbers. And the first piece, my function is equal to 1. And my measure, the measure of the integers, uh, uh, zp and qp is 1. So, uh, well, I guess the bottom is uh, cut off somehow. OK. Uh, and uh, well, then I sum over the other charts or the other pieces, and I get this expression. Now, OK, so what is the uh, uh, special value at s equals 2? s was a complex number. At s equals 2, uh, look here. So I see 1 minus p to the minus 2 divided by 1 minus p to the uh, minus 1. And so I get p plus 1 over p. And this is the number of points on p1 divided by p to the 1, which is the dimension of p1. Now, uh, it's interesting. So we've integrated over the open piece of p1, affine a1. But we find information about the completed thing, the p1. So, well, we'll interpret this as a volume with respect to some natural measure on this variety. And, uh, well, we can do it in a more general setup. We start with some algebraic variety over number field. Uh, well, we use look at uh, rational points normally, but in many questions you want to understand periodic points first. Uh, now, I wrote here a delicate limitized Line bundle, okay, this introductory workshop, what is a line bundle? It's a family of lines, varying, and matrice just means that in every line, you know, you know, one. You can measure, uh, you have a length. So in 95, Emmanuel Perry introduced uh, uh, a Tamagawa measure and Tamagawa number of Fano varieties. Well, it's actually quite general, you don't need the final property at all. So all you need is the metrization of the canonical or anti-canonical line bundle. And then the way this construction works, you pick a point, you introduce local analytic coordinates, so either in the p or the real, so the complex numbers, doesn't matter. So then you look at the local section of the canonical line bundle. Well, I wrote it down. And because we now have, you know, metrized a metric, you know what the norm of that section is. So that's denoted with these double brackets here. And then you multiply it with a, a Haar measure on fv to the d, uh, normalized in some way. And then you get locally uh, a measure. And now it turns out that when you change coordinates, uh, you go from chart to chart. Well, you know you have to write down the absolute value of the Jacobian for these kind of coordinate transformations. It turns out that this thing that's defined locally globalizes over the uh, whole uh, projective uh, variety, the viadic points. And uh, the main result is that for almost all places, you integrate over the open piece. It's the same thing as an integral over the whole thing. But you know, viadic points of a projective variety, it's like integral points. And the integral points, you can reduce mod p. So now you have a finite sum. And it turns out that if you look at the uh, piece sitting over that reduction mod p, that all those integrals are the same and give you just 1 over q to the dimension. And so now you've summed over all uh, points mod p. And that's the answer. So this was relevant for you know, some other things. But uh, the first applications, 
coming out of this concerned, uh, for example, Calabi-Yau varieties. So you look at birational Calabi-Yau's, let's say, over a number field of some dimension. So, and it's a trivial canonical line bundle, so there's a canonical metrization. It's just constants. You just take your periodic absolute value on the constants. And then the formula says that when you integrate, you get the number of FQ points. And so Victor Batterev observed that, well, you have two birational calabi -Yaus. So you integrate first there. It's the same thing as integrating over the open part. Well, but the open part is the same here and there. And it's the same integral. So the measures give the same answer. So it's the same thing as the integral over the closed thing. And so then you get this identity for the number of FQ points. Now, once you have that for all Qs, you conclude that, you know, birational calabi -Yaus have, you know, equal Betty numbers and things like this. And that also became kind of the impetus, the starting point for what's now known as motivic integration. Now, uh, so there is a recent result I want to point out. If you have derived equivalent K3 surfaces, well, uh, over a finite field, then it turns out that uh, their numbers of FQ points are also the same. That's a recent result of Lee and Olson. And it would be great if we can view this identity also as some identity of some periodic integrals. But I have nothing to report on that. Now, uh, developing this principle, so we can integrate not only with canonical measure, but we can introduce functions on our analytic varieties and try to integrate functions. So the setup now is as follows. You have some smooth projective variety X. You have the risky open U, and we assume that the boundary uh, is a normal crossing divisor. So there are several components, they intersect, and there is this kind of stratification by multiple intersections and so on and so on. So we can write the anti-canonical class as uh, uh, represented in this form. In our number theoretic applications, the open part is usually an algebraic group, affine space, things like this. Now, uh, Okay, so we have this stratification by intersections and complements to smaller intersections, I mean, smaller dimensional intersections. And now, uh, okay, so we know that these are smooth, so some co-dimension and so on. And now we're going to introduce functions on our variety, and the functions are going to be simply distance, periodic distance to the boundary stratum d alpha to a divisor. What do we mean by distance? So here is an example. So now let's take the same P1 and take out two points, zero and infinity. So I'm gonna write down a function H0, which is over there, and H1, which is over there. So here I omitted writing viadic via valuations. You take your favorite valuation. That's a distance to zero or infinity. And now uh, we can, in general, you know, distance would mean you introduce some coordinate, and then you just take this coordinate and take its periodic absolute value, okay? And so now take a product over these distances to the boundary strata, raise them to some complex powers as alpha, and integrate this function uh, with respect to the measure which we introduced, okay? So uh, now, when you do integration, you work on these manifolds, periodic real complex manifolds. Uh, how do you compute integrals? You do partition of unity. And in each stratum, you uh, have you know, nice coordinates. So after partition of unity near the stratum uh, dA, where dA is the intersection of the d alpha, alpha, and A, your function looks like this. It's just a product over the things that participate in your stratum x alpha to the s alpha, and now I wrote minus rho alpha, well, just for uh, convenience, uh, where this rho alpha was the multiplicity of the anti-canonical class along this divisor. So, well, essentially, it's a product of integrals uh, of this form, and we've computed one of these before on P1. This is what it is. And so we know how to do that, and the answer is, and that's the Neff's formula, that for almost all places, you get an answer like this. Now, so see what happens when you put S alpha equal to rho alpha in this formula. 
So S alpha minus rho alpha is then zero. Then you have Q minus one divided by Q minus one. That whole thing completely disappears. And what's left there is simply a different expression for the number of FQ points on your complete variety divided by Q to the dimension. So this is a refinement of this uh, formula of pairs that I showed you before. It's a refinement. It carries these complex numbers as alpha in it. And uh, you can use this. It's a function in S alphas. And you know, it has poles. You can understand the poles and leading constants and so on and so on. This is a local computation. You also want to do it adelically. You want to regularize the adelic things. But all of this is outside today's discussion. OK, so there is this formula. Now, oops, sorry. I did it. Hey. Ah. So, computers. Escape. Uh, full screen. Enter full screen. All right. So, uh, the applications go like this. Uh, so, this integral, so obviously, we are integrating over u, the risky open sink. It doesn't know anything about the compactification. It doesn't care. So if you take the same function on the open U and do something strange on the boundary, like blow up and things like this, it won't change. The answer will not change. So the answer is a beautiful invariant, let's say, of singularities, if they happen to reside in the boundary. In fact, you can formulate various uh, properties of singularities, terminal, log terminal, everything like this in terms of simply convergence of these kind of integrals. All right, so it encodes information about the boundary. And uh, in other applications, it's sort of central in understanding analytic spectral uh, properties of these height theta functions, understanding volume asymptotics if you just work periodically, and so on and so on. OK, so this was the introduction. Now, the uh, basic questions that we see in this kind of analysis, OK, so on the one hand, it's arithmetic. It's of the periodics, finite fields. On the other hand, it, it codes something about geometry. And then you also want to understand how much geometry can be read off from arithmetic. And these are motivating questions. So now, the other thing, rationality, the other title of the workshop, just a reminder, varieties are rational, stable rational, or unirational. So those are important. Uh, properties, uh, classical results in small dimensions, over algebraically closed fields, uh, all notions coincide. In dimension three, they're not the same. Uh, you know, there are classical results from early 70s uh, to the effect that, well, there exists unirational but not rational threefolds of the complex numbers, the rational rigidity method for a quartic in P4, intermediate Jacobians for cubics in P4, and then uh, the Art and Mumford example, unirationality does not imply stable rationality because they produce the conic bundle with a non trivial Brouwer group, which is an abstraction to stable rationality. And then finally, stable rationality does not imply rationality in dimension three. Um, and the abstraction, uh, again, I mean, so there's a method of universal torsors developed by Kölner, Tulens, and Sixfurt, and Dyer, which allows to prove uh, a stable rationality of. Uh, um, certain threefolds fibered over P1, this generic fiber degree four to Petzl surface. And then uh, if you fiber it the other way, you get a conic bundle over a surface where the intermediate Jacobian is not a product of Jacobians, of course, and therefore you have failure of rationality, but you can prove stable rationality. Anyway, so this is kind of the background. And then there was a breakthrough uh, in uh, 2013. Uh, was well, discovered that integral decomposition of the diagonal uh, provides you know, very powerful approach to proving failure uh, of uh, stable rationality uh, for varieties for which all the abstractions that I mentioned, variational rigidity, intermediate Jacobians, Brouwer group, vanish. So you look at uh, uh, you know, a variety that has no obvious abstractions to stable rationality, you degenerate if the special fibers mildly singular, and has some abstraction, for example, non-trivial Brouwer group or unrefined cohomology that Claire just explained, uh, well then, that one fact from the special fiber translates into failure of stable rationality for very general fiber of the family. So that's very, very powerful. 
So Kodotelan and Perutka, that here was also on the board, uh, introduced a related notion uh, also based on the theory of uh, zero cycles, uh, the universal uh, uh, CH0 triviality. And then in 2017, Isai and Shinda realized that, in fact, you don't have to uh, go via the theory of zero cycles. There is a result that says that stable rationality itself directly specializes in mildly singular families. And then very soon after, Maxim Konsevich and I discovered that you don't need to look at uh, classes, stable rationality classes. You just have to look at rationality classes. And there is this new invariant, which is called the Burnside group or ring, which is uh, you know, a billion group generated by classes of rationality classes of algebraic varieties. So where does it come from? So, and what's this uh, uh, approach? Uh, so in 2003, Larson and Lutz proved that if you look at the K0 of algebraic varieties, remember it's you know, x, u, x minus u, and then kind of relations, scissor relations. Uh, then if you take this and quotient out by the class of the affine line, what you get is uh, a abelian group spent by classes of algebraic varieties modulus stable rationality. It's kind of beautiful. So, and again, I totally underappreciated when it first came out because the proof is very short. It uses only two things. It uses Bittner's presentation uh, of K0 and, uh, well, the big hammer, it's a weak factorization that tells you that if you have two birational varieties, then you can factor the birational correspondence in basic steps, elementary steps, which are blow-ups and smooth centers, and that's essential. So, and then uh, what he says and Chandra realized that this K0 modulo L uh, admits something that they called motivic reduction formula. So if you have a family, it's a, a kind of a homomorphism from a, this group, K0 mod L of the generic fiber into K0 mod L of the special fiber. And then, uh, okay, so this was inspired by uh, motivic integration, in fact, by the motivic version of the formula that I showed you before of the Deneff formula, without the complex numbers, just directly. The, well, anyway, so, and what Maxim and I realized is that, well, we actually, we can do the same thing, an analog of this motivic reduction for the things that's of interest to us, the uh, group spent by isomorphism classes, I mean, by rational isomorphism classes. Now, let me explain this in a little bit more detail. And I want to emphasize that this is directly sort of the generalization of what we've seen before with integration. The integration thing, it was kind of an absolute version of what you're seeing here. So we integrate over the open part and we pick up the answer, which is labeled by, let's say, FQ points on the boundary, things like this, all right? And then the formula that you've written down is invariant under blow-ups. Now think about the relative situation. So we have this family, and then a divisor is missing, so to speak, and that's a special fiber. It's like you have to close up the variety. It's not projective yet. It's gonna be projective after you close it up. Okay, and then the only thing that you want, you want to write down a formula for anything with the special fiber that will be invariant under blow-ups, okay? Well, you have a prototype of these formulas. The periodic integrals give you kind of some plus minus plus minus a few points of the boundary. Forget a few points, just take these boundary strata components plus minus. But the way things are set up from the perspective of integrating, again, you don't, care about the closure. The integral is completely well-defined. It will know automatically about the closure. So here again, if you write down a sensible formula, it's a triviality to show that it then is invariant under blow-ups. And that's exactly what we did, and this is a formula. Now, it's not unique. You can write down many formulas in this case, but that's a formula. So you write the special fiber as a union of these dividers. That's your stratification intersecting, you know, the alpha. Okay, they come as multiplicities. Forget multiplicities. It's irrelevant. And then, uh, instead of taking FQ points, just take the variety itself, its birational class, multiply with affine space in the corresponding dimension, and that's your specialization map. 
And then to make sure it's well defined, you just prove compatibility with blowups, which is not difficult. So, uh, well, that has applications that I will talk about later. But there is a very big area of birational geometry that uh, is uh, concerned with equivariant uh, geometry. So now, why do we need all these invariants, birational invariants? Is because even if you're given two varieties that are supposed to be birational, how do you come up with the geometric construction that does this uh, birationality? That's very hard in practice. And if you want to show that something like this doesn't exist, I mean, that's where these specializations come in. I mean, so if you want to show that there is no birational construction in the, special fi in the general fibers, then you specialize, and maybe there are abstractions. So anyway, you would want to do something like this uh, for varieties with an action of a finite group. Why? Because, for example, even P3, you can look at birational evolutions in P3, like Z2 actions, birational Z2 actions on P3, it turns out that you don't have a complete classification of that. Now, in dimension two, of course, uh, you can do that. And there is also interesting activity, you know, going back to the Italians, Manin and so on, looked at G equivariant del pezzo surfaces and things like this. But in dimension three, well, you have various classes of these involutions, and then you don't know are they disjoint, are they not disjoint, maybe they are the same. Uh, they just have different descriptions. And if you look at, uh, let's say, even cyclic actions, you know, Z3, Z5. Anyway, so it's an interesting problem to try to understand these cyclic subgroups of, the, of a higher dimensional Cremona group. So uh, let's look at equivariant birational types in this connection. So we start with a finite abelian group. Let's look at its characters. Let's look at some smooth projective variety with a G action. So a priori, the G action is birational. But after blow-ups, we can make sure that it's actually uh, it's a regular action. And that's good enough. And now we can look at the fixed point loci for the G action. It's kind of sub-varieties. And how much of the action do we see? Well, if you have some things that's fixed by the G action, then in the tangent bundle, normal bundle, we see the characters of the group G. More general of G is non abelian some kind of representation. So let's keep track of this data. So I'm going to write down a sum where you know, a piece is just the, let's say, birational type of my uh, fixed point locus there. And then what's in these brackets is simply a collection of characters of G, which is elements in A, that show up in the tangent bundle. OK. So uh, and now we want an invariant out of this. So how do we compute an invariant? Well, we just take a G equivariant blow up. And we write down the same thing. And then we want the difference to be 0 in whatever group of invariants uh, we come up with. So what does it translate into? So Maxim Konsevich and I, so that's the paper that I'm describing. Um, it's very recent. So uh, we introduced birational types, B, N of G, as follows. So it's generated by these symbols, A1, A2, AN, which are simply characters of G. And uh, well, there are some assumptions that uh, they generate A in this sense. Then if you look at the um, characters in the tangent bundle, you can't really order them. You don't know what's first, what's second. So therefore, your symbol is invariant under permutation. And then you just write down a formula for what happens under a blow up and take a difference, and that's a formula. And now just forget about x alpha. The only thing that we want to keep is simply the collection of these characters. So that's one group. So now there is another group which we call modular or motivic types, which is, well, please compare these two slides. The one thing you notice, the brackets are not square, but they're like L angle, R angle. And the other thing that you should notice is that the summation is slightly different. But apart from that, it's really the same. So look here and look here. One more time. Here and here. So they look the same. They're not quite the same. Uh, I'll explain. But the one thing that I can say right away is that when you look at this class, 
that it's actually a well-defined G equivariant by rational invariant. So now we can enhance this. Here you see I forgot the birational type of X alpha, but I can keep the birational type of X alpha, and then we have something on top of the old Burnside rings that we considered the old from last year with Maxime, and well, that's kind of an enhancement of that in the G equivariant setup. So I introduced two things which looked the same, but were not quite the same, and so there is a map naturally. So there is something that maps the square brackets into the angled brackets. And you see it's almost the same except there is a two. So a uh, theorem which takes, I don't know, 10 pages, is that it's actually a well-defined homomorphism subjective modulo two torsion. So, okay, now we conjecture that it's actually an isomorphism modulo two torsion. And the conjecture boils down to the following Mass Olympics problem that the class of 0, 0, 1 in B3 of Z mod NZ is two torsion, or torsion element of order a power of two for all N. Just say click groups and just that. So you try this on a computer, it works. But, well, hopefully it always works. But I hope I convinced you that these two things, that BN and the MN, kind of very similar. Now, uh, so let's be more explicit. Let's look at the simplest example, Z mod P, and uh, let's look at B2. So it's generated by symbol, say 1A2, that condition of spanning the characters is simply GCD of A1, A2, P equals to 1. Not both of them are 0 mod P. And then it's a symmetry thing. And then there is this relation that over there and the other relation. Okay. So uh, now let's look at the other one, the M2 guy. And well, the same conditions, the same equations, except there is no constraint A1 not equal A2 over there. And therefore, the only difference between these groups is that here AA is equal to A0, and over there it's equal to 2 A0. OK? So there are these two things. Now, so let me just again put it in perspective of birational geometry. These things are responsible for co-dimension two things, right? So we are looking at uh, actions which have something in co-dimension two. Now, the MN turns out carries Hecke operators. You can define uh, commuting Hecke operators. Uh, so here is the example in the previous case. Well, it looks familiar to people working with automorphic uh, forms. It's, of course, sum over some lattices, over lattices or under lattices of index, uh, some power of uh, your primes that you look at. So here are the eigenvalues of T2 on M2 Z mod 59. I hope you are as impressed by certain features of this plot. So let's go back to these equations in the simplest case of uh, M2 or B2. So we pick up something like P squared equations and P squared variables. Now linear equations. You see I view these relations as simply equations on my symbols, linear equations on my symbols, and then I'm asking, well, are there any solutions to this huge system? Well, so when you have P squared equations on P squared variables, you don't expect any solutions a priori. Here we find p squared plus 23 over 24. So when we first plotted this, boom, 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 wow. So 24, I can see one half, but where is the three coming from? Anyway, 24 was a strong hint that there is something related to automorphic forms in the picture. Uh, but then you can also look not only as a q-vector space spent by these symbols, but also fp-vector spaces for various primes. And it turns out that there you get jumps. Uh, the dimensions go up. So there is interesting p-torsion, for example, at 37 and you know, many other primes. Now, when you go to higher co-dimensions, so n equals big 3, 4, 5, and so on and so on, they become even more overdetermined. It's a huge number of equations. And uh, for example, the Q rank of B3, experimentally, 
was p squared minus 1 over 24 plus 1 minus p minus 1 over 2. Now, I said we plotted it for the first primes up to 41, and we were convinced that this is the answer. But then we tried the next prime, and it actually jumps. There are actually extra dimensions for certain primes, for example, 43, 59, 67, and so on. So, uh, by now, you should be expecting some connection to these uh, automorphic forms. So there is something called Manning symbols, modular symbols. Uh, okay, they are generated by symbols, CD and Z mod N, and uh, GCD equals 1, subject to, uh, well, not quite symmetric, like CD is not DC, but there is this little bit strange uh, relation, and there is another relation like this, well, in our case, you see we had C minus D, here we think minus C minus D, looks kind of similar. But when you look at the dimension, for example, for the space of, you know, the cuspidal uh, forms, holomorphic forms for gamma 1 of P, then you see a number that showed up in our experiments. Okay, so that was kind of a very uh, nice uh, hint that we should try to compare these things. So there is an involution on this uh, space of uh, modular symbols, on this M2. Uh, CD goes to minus C minus CD. The plus eigen space is kind of relevant because uh, some subspace of this plus eigen space, the ones of cuspidal modular symbols, is actually dual to the S2 that I wrote down. So then you can look at uh, some classes in this subspace, okay, spent by elements of the form that I wrote down, with angle brackets prime, and the notation is very suggestive. These are actually the same. So it's kind of mysterious why a rational geometry in co-dimension two is spitting out modular forms. And if you look at higher co-dimensions, what comes out is very closely related to the work of Ash and others on modular symbols for uh, arithmetic subgroups of GLN, Z, and so on and so on. So now some computations. Uh, again, you could look at uh, the jumping of these things mod L, and the computer tells you that there are frequent jumps for primes dividing either plus or minus uh, the prime, plus minus one, P plus minus one. So there are all kinds of things that we observed in dimension three. Uh, the Q rank of Z mod 163 jumps by 10. You know, the expected thing was P minus five times P minus seven over 24, but it jumps by 10. So there's some extra motive there. Uh, now, so here is a, a table. The top row tells you the Q rank of these things, so for example, at 41, uh, 43 you see one, and then it, you know, the non-prime things, they get pretty large, and that's the behavior of the two uh, part when you do it uh, modulo F2, the jump over the rational one. So to summarize, okay, uh, we start with these birational invariants, we construct things that carry Hecke operators, uh, that are very closely related to these birational invariants, uh, well, you can do it in the non-abelian setup. Then instead of characters, you keep track of, well, representations, uh, reducible representations, or their characters in the uh, tangent space. Uh, um, so, uh, again, you can either keep track of the birational type of the fixed point locus or not keep track of it. It's up to you. And, and you, you get some refined equivariant birational invariants. And then, one more time, there is this connection between the Cremona group and automorphic forms that uh, is just staring at us in the face. So now, different chapter, I want to uh, talk about applications of the specialization method. And uh, as soon as uh, Claire pointed out that you know, there is this uh, new approach and uh, there are examples where uh, it yields you know, previously unattainable you know, results. Uh, many people um, picked up this uh, theme, and uh, Coriotel and Perutka looked at cortex threefolds, 
uh, Bouville, Totaro, and others uh, uh, produced many examples, you know, classes of varieties for which you know, failure of stable rationality was established via this specialization, this method of integral decomposition of the diagonal. So Brandon um, has it under Grash and I. We got interested in this as well. The first thing we did was to look at conic bundles over rational surfaces, uh, original examples of Artin and Mumford. And uh, we showed that as soon as the discriminant is sufficiently large, sufficiently large degree, then a very general member of the corresponding family fails stable rationality. So two years ago, Andrew Crash and I did this for uh, twisted P2 bundles over rational surfaces uh, as well. So this required you know, some foundational work on uh, models of such things over high dimensional basis. So once we did the conic bundles, uh, we looked at the next class uh, of uh, rationally connected varieties in dimension three, namely Delpezzo vibrations uh, over uh, P1. Uh, the first interesting case is a quartic Delpezzo vibration over P1. It can be degenerate to a conic bundle of a rational surface of the kinds that we looked at. And so if you find one that's not parational to cubic threefold, not rational, then it fails stable rationality. Uh, so, uh, Krilov Okada proved this, uh, the corresponding result for uh, cubic uh, surface vibrations over P1, uh, Delpezzo surface vibrations of degree one, degree two as well. So now that case is settled. So the next one was okay, there is a Fano three folds proper, like a smooth Fano three folds. There are many, many families, but it turns out that there is kind of a uniform way to specialize them to, well, quartic Delpezzo vibrations over P1. And to us, actually finding this uniform specialization was perhaps more important than the results, that you look at uh, this family and you find that if you're not birational to cubic uh, threefold and you're not rational, then you're not stable rational. So this sort of completes the picture in dimension three on a algebraically closed field. Essentially, we've settled, all of us, stable rationality uh, problem for you know general varieties in, in rationally connected varieties, uh, and what's left, it, and that's of course a big open problem, is to understand cubic three folds and cubic four folds for that matter as well. Now, um, so again, the, the beauty here is that there are no obstructions before specialization. You just don't see anything. You, you don't find obstructions to stable rationality. So then we also wanted to understand rationality in families. So we look at what happens in a family. Here the discovery was that uh, rationality can jump and the construction of these examples is quite straightforward. It's just a family of uh, quadric surface bundles over P2. So given here, for example, is a 2-2 hypersurface in P2 times P3, you project it to the first P2, you see a quadric. Well, and the specialization method of Claire shows that the very general one is not stable rational. Of course, we need to make some assumptions on the uh, discriminant of this uh, vibration. And then the rational ones are dense and moduli. So uh, how do we do it? Well, it uh, works uh, when the, uh, the generation locus is just a union of the three coordinate hyperplanes with a circle. It's not some kind of symbol from, anyway, so, so this is a geometric picture that you should remember. So the conic in the middle, that's tangent to the three coordinate hyperplane, that's where the rank of the quadric drops by one, and the rank of the quadric sink drops by two along the coordinate hyperplanes. It, it turns out that you take some class downstairs that's ramified, uh, but when you lift it to, uh, downstairs I mean on P2, but when you lift it to the fourfold, the special ramification pattern along the coordinate hyperplanes make sure that ramification eats ramification and don't get upstairs is actually an unramified class. So this is uh, then, or has been generalized by Perutka. She has an algorithm which computes the Brow group of the unramified H2 of these kind of four folds. Uh, all you need to put into this algorithm is the ramification pattern for the quadric bundle downstairs. And uh, okay, the rationality, it's, so this is how you prove that the very general fiber is not stable rational. The rationality 
goes back to Brandon's treatment of cubic fourfolds as a plane. You project, you get the quadric uh, surface bundle over P2, and well, if that quadric has a multi-section of odd degree, then that shows the quadric is rational over the function field of P2, and then the fourfold is rational, things like this. So, well, we are very happy. We looked at other uh, fourfolds, uh, for example, double covers of P4, intersection of three quadrics in P7, and uh, uh, that again produced uh, families where the um, very general member fails stable rationality, but the rational ones are dense over the moduli. And so, for example, intersection of three quadrics in P7. So rank Picard is Z. There is nothing, you know, there is no Gallo action that you can see. There is simply no obstruction that you can see, but the obstruction is hiding in a, some specialization that you have to find. And then there is spectacular work by Schreider, quite recent. He looks at quadric bundles in higher dimensions and can use it to prove failure of stable rationality for uh, hypersurfaces of rather low degree, like logarithmic. Now, so, uh, so I mentioned that we understand the stable rationality problem over algebraically closed uh, uh, fields in dimension three, but uh, if you come from arithmetic, you also want to understand what happens over non-closed fields. Okay, take your Delpezzo surface over non-closed field, of course, rationality there is understood. Stable rationality is still open in general. There are some cases where you suspect stable rationality, but you can't prove or disprove it. So let's look at the threefold situation. And uh, well, uh, can we have uh, something that's geometrically rational, but not rational while having a rational point? So for example, if you work over a C of T, every you know, final variety will have a rational point. So, okay. And, uh, uh, you know, if we you know, pose the question as I did, there are immediately counterexamples because uh, there are actually three dimensional tori that are not rational over a non closed field. So, how does it work? So, you see, to get uh, a torus over a non closed field, so you need to understand a finite subgroup of GLNZ, where n is the dimension of the torus and how it acts on the lattice of characters, which is z to the n, okay? And an abstraction to rationality is uh, the first Gallo cohomology for this action, for, or group cohomology for this action. And so it turns out that in dimension two, you can't have any group cohomology, they're just two, you know, the subgroups of, it, of GL and Z, find the subgroups are very small, GL2Z. But GL3Z, I mean, you can have a group of 4 or 48 in GL3Z, and in particular, you start looking at you know, all possible subgroups of this group of order 48, and you discover that if you have a very special Z2 plus Z2 sitting inside, that will produce a non-trivial H1. And that non-trivial H1 is not gonna go away, that's going to be an abstraction to rationality. Now you take this non-rational torus, therefore in dimension three, and compactify it. Look at the toric variety with this torus. So the variety is not going to be rational because the torus is not rational. Okay? Well, so, and uh, Kunyavsky in the 90s, so he classified everything inside, and there are just 15 types of these sections, and all these 15 types contain your Z2 plus Z2. So, however, when you look at smooth toric Fano threefolds, for example, P1 times the surface of degree six and things like this, they do not allow this particular Gallo action that I mentioned for some reason. So this has to do with how the fan interacts with the group action. You need the fan to be G equivariant. And so when you look at the fans inside for smooth toric Fano threefolds, you just don't find it. Therefore, if they have a rational point, those things, they are rational. Now, if you look at M06 bar, you know, there are non rational forms as well that has recently been studied by Lawrence Reichstein. So, the things that you want to prove in joint work with Brandon, you're not there yet, but what is emerging is that you have a non toric, geometrically rational, smooth final threefold, very general in this family, then it's actually not stably rational over the ground field. 
So here the ground field is going to be C of t, just for. So our favorite example is at the section of two quadrics in P5. So as before, rank Picard is z. So if you have a rational point on such a thing, you can project and you get a quadric surface bundle over P1. So if you are on algebraically closed field, there's going to be a section. A quadric is a point, is rational. So the threefold is rational. So there is no problem over an algebraically closed field. OK, so that's what we have. So what happens over non-closed field? Oh, by the way, the intermediate Jacobian of this thing, of course, is the quadric surface bundle over P1 has six degenerate fibers. Because we have P5, you know, this quadric pencil in P5, so there are six variables. The matrix is six times six, so the determinant degree six. So you have six points on P1. And the intermediate Jacobian is simply the Jacobian of this genus two curve. That's it. So of course, it's the Jacobian of a genus two curve. There is no abstraction to rationality anywhere inside. But when you look at this over a non-closed field, for example, the function field of P1, now what you're seeing is a quadric surface bundle over P1 times P1. And it turns out that here the degeneration pattern is like this, if you specialize. So you can specialize your thing to this, where the rank of the quadrics drops by two. So this is in P1 times P1. Boom, 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 boom. And the conic in the middle rank drops by one. So it's very similar to the previous picture. It has a non-trivial Brow group. This is where Perutka's algorithm applies. And that will show that uh, this thing is not stably rational over C of t um, because it specializes to something that's not stably rational. So very general member will not be stably rational. The singularity is a, a, analysis to make sure that you can apply the specialization method is straightforward. It's very similar to the previous case. That's why I drew the pictures like this. There is another approach to the same example. So take P3 and take four points, the standard points, 1, 0, 0, 0, blow them up. OK? So you write down this linear system, and it turns out that this is what you get. It's in the section of two quadrics. This is it. Now, this is toric, because blowing up those four points in P3, right? It's all in the boundary. It's, it's a toric thing. So this is a toric threefold, singular toric threefold, and the section of two quadrics. Now, uh, so what's the possible Gallo action? Of course, you can move around the four points. That's your S4 action. But then there's a Cremona involution. That's an extra Z mod 2. OK? So that's your group that's acting. So it turns out that if you take the Cremona involution and any other Z mod 2, that will give non-trivial group cohomology and abstraction to rationality. So take this and twist it so that over the non-closed field, the toric threefold is now non-rational. Now you can twist it in a family. So in other words, you'll get a family of such things specializing to something that's not rational over the field. So that's another approach to proving failure of rationality, let's say, or stable rationality for intersection of two quadrics or these kind of fields. So as soon as your field admits a Gallo group, like Z2 plus Z2, as I described, you're in business. Now, I should uh, kind of explain the difference uh, and the advantages of this method of proving directly that you have failure of rationality or stable rationality as compared to applying the method of the decomposition of the diagonal. In the method of the decomposition of the diagonal, the exceptional loci where you could have rationality, they come from projections of some varieties, parameterizing Hilbert scheme, things like this, onto the base. And then you know these are all kind of proper sub-varieties, whatever you project to the base it's not going to exhaust the whole base, but you have to exclude a countable union of some, some things in the base. OK. Now, suppose you want to apply the same argument of a non-closed field to a variety that's, algebraic, that's geometrically rational. It's geometrically rational, so there is some construction. So there will be some point of an algebraic closure that will map onto this thing. But now you can very well have a situation where the points of a non-closed field, you see, you look at the pre-images, 
and there is projections, well, you know, some points over some extensions. So in other words, it's not really working, the method of the diagonal on the face of it, because you would need to control exactly which points are we talking about on those varieties that parameterize rationality constructions up there. And because you're geometrically rational, every point on the base will come from some of these varieties. And controlling the field is impossible. Now, but if you use uh, Nikes and you know, the other argument, then you just not need to know rationality, stable rationality, specializes. Uh, OK, so now, um, so uh, if you want to think about other final threefolds, there is a big industry in mirror symmetry looking at toric degenerations of Fano three-folds because they really like it, and four-folds because they want to see their calabi uh, sitting inside um, toric uh, varieties. And so, and how do you get calabi You start with the Fano four-fold, you look at, you know, anti-canonical section, you get your calabi and then you want to... So, there's been a lot of work on that, the Lando Ginsburg models of these Fano uh, three-folds, and that's related to that. So, and those of interest to us, the geometrical rational ones, you start looking through the tables, through the list, actually you find that they do admit specializations to singular toric varieties, with the symmetries seem to be compatible with uh, non-trivial Galo cohomology. So that's an approach to you know, pushing kind of the study of stable rationality in kind of, uh, to, towards questions in arithmetic geometry of non-closed field. So I was encouraged to uh, end early because apparently there is a bus waiting for all of you outside to take you down in like 10, 15 minutes. So I'm finishing early as charged. Thank you for your attention. So the kind of applications that uh, would hope for. So for example, there is, uh, if you look at Z mod 11 in dimension three, which is co-dimension three, uh, the Q vector space is rank one. So there is an interesting Z mod 11 action or invariant in co-dimension three. Okay, would be great to see that implemented somewhere in yeah, but that requires really hands-on rational geometry. So the goal, okay, the next things that are sort of on the list, specialization for these kind of invariants, all right? Extension to the non-commutative case, where the formula that I wrote down becomes more complicated because you have to also keep track, well, anyway, you have to keep track of stabilizers for the actions. I mean, there is a lot of stuff there. I mean, people who are doing uh, root stacks are very good at these things. So to keep track of stabilizers and produce models where the stabilizers are constant along this strata and how to pass from here to there. So that's good. And once we have these kind of specializations, then I hope we can distinguish uh, these uh, different rational actions. That will be a tool to distinguish them without an explicit factorization a priori, just understanding them as a special fiber. So, okay, let me give you the simplest application. So that, take P1 with a Z mod five action. Okay, two fixed points, zero infinity. Okay, so let's write down our invariant. In the first case, the eigenvalue is like one and four. In the second case, two and three. So the symbols that we write down, there are no relations in B1 whatsoever. So symbol is one plus four, and the other symbol is two plus three. They're not equal. Therefore, P1 has two Z mod five equivariant structures, okay? Z mod three doesn't work, but Z mod five works. So that's a kind of application, it's a trivial thing. And I can do an example like this in dimension two, when I look at D5, I can produce two rational surfaces, like obviously birational, but not D5 equivariantly birational looking at different representations of D5, you know, this and that, adding the minus one representation, projectivizing, and so anyway, so that's, so you can play with this, and I think there is a lot of potential, but.
Yes. Specialized to finite fields. Um, uh, so uh, the things that I explained relies on weak factorization. Now, this is not known in positive or mixed characteristic. If we had this, then we could push through, for example, the birational types, the Burnside ring, and things like this. And, and then we could also contemplate specializing to finite fields and things. But as stands, it's not outside current technology and All right.